Hello and welcome to the Monday, March 11th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Got a couple interesting diaries by Didi about analyzing malicious HTA files. Part of this is based on work by one of our readers, Ahmed, who had actually some issues analyzing these files. The trick with HTA files is they're HTML applications. That's what HTA stands for. But unlike normal HTML and JavaScript, they're not executed by the browser. They're executed by the HTA engine or mshta.exe. And some of the constraints that apply to browsers do not apply to the HTA engine. They run with the full privileges of the user opening the file. So real good way to sort of infiltrate malicious scripts into the user system. All the user has to do again is double click and open the particular file. And probably not a big surprise that in the end, uh, this particular script ended up executing PowerShell and did he go through a process how he was able to deobfuscate this particular script. And Guy wrote a brief diary taking a quick look at oh, the comparison between port scans to port 22 and 2222. Of course, the second is a very frequent alternative port for SSH. And well, uh, Guy's uh, conclusion was no big surprise here that that port gets scanned, uh, well, not almost as often as port 22, but about a third of the scans are going to the port 2222. 22 instead of 22. So it doesn't really make sense to hide SH on that port. Pick a different port and you have a better chance of evading regular scans. And I believe a port 2022 has become such a big target, in particular after Mirai and such incorporated this particular port into their scanning routine. But let's talk about a couple of vulnerabilities that uh, were released and some of them patched in the last couple of days. First of all, Apache Solar patched yet another deserialization vulnerability. They're rating this critical because it can lead to arbitrary code execution. This is a classic type of vulnerability that we have seen exploited a lot in the past. So wouldn't be surprised to see an exploit for this very quickly if it hasn't already been released. And Google announced last week that they found a Chrome vulnerability that they recently patched was used to attack Windows 7 systems. In order to actually make the attack work, it required not just an exploit for the Google Chrome vulnerability, but also a Windows 7 exploit that apparently has not been fixed and probably will not be fixed because Windows 7 is no longer supported. So the solution here is up upgrade to Windows 10. You should at least upgrade Chrome if you're using it on Windows 7 if for whatever reason you do need to hold on to Windows 7. But given that this vulnerability is already known, is being exploited in the wild, you really should think hard about replacing your remaining Windows 7 systems with Windows 10. An internet security company, Pentest Partners, took a look at different car alarms and they looked at the high-end ones that cost several thousand dollars that allow you to actually have an internet enabled access to your car alarm. No surprise here, no matter the price tag, all of these car alarms were pretty much vulnerable. Now, Everybody, I guess, at this point would expect that it would be pretty easy to disable the car alarm, maybe unlock the doors, but the vulnerabilities actually went well beyond this. So, for example, with car alarms made by Viper, it was possible to kill the engine while the car was driving, which is actually quite dangerous, in particular if the car is driving at accelerated speeds. Another manufacturer called Pandora, which actually advertise itself as unhackable. And if anything is a good uh, pointer to 
network, its system being hackable than it is usually advertisements like this. Well, uh, in this case, they advertise that it's possible uh, to kill the engine, but apparently that feature wasn't working. There is also a feature in Pandora that allows you to enable a microphone in the car and listen in and uh, various additional, of course, control messages. Also, of course, standard vulnerable features like the ability to follow GPS coordinates, even look at the history of them via the account that the particular app is connected to. Now, all of this wouldn't be much of a problem if the APIs and web applications running these systems would be somewhat secure. In Pandora's case, it's trivial to reset any password because the actual verified email address isn't validated. In the case of the Viper Smart Start Alarm, a third party is providing the API access. And again, it's possible without authentication to modify user's account and with that get full access to the account. And then a quick reminder about our Raspberry Pi contest. First of all, this month, David won the Raspberry Pi. Now, this month for March, I'm going to do this a little bit different. I will not announce which location I'll be in for one week uh, this month. If you guess the location, send me an email. Everybody gets up to three guesses and whoever gets it the closest first will win the Raspberry Pi. Also, due to some travel I'll have to do, there will be no podcast for Thursday this week. Please submit any entries to the contest via the Internet Storm Signers contact page and mention podcast as part of the subject to make it easier at the end of the month to actually pull the winning solution. That's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.